Last Sunday, we discussed uh, two major issues as it relates to um, unity in the Lord's body, and that is uh, the doctrine of Christ and how it is a, uh, a format and a formula to, for us to, to uh, unite uh, into Christ if we stay inside the doctrine of Christ. And um, I believe it was Andy that told me that I was only talking about half of the equation there last week because there's those that, that are outside of that doctrine of Christ and how do we deal with those as well. And so this week I'd like to explore a little bit about false teaching and correcting error. And I think that um, Andy might tell me this week that I'm still missing part of it, but we'll keep working at it until we get all of it addressed. So um, let me uh, fix this just for a moment. There we go. So this week we're going to talk about a few things. Can truth be known? Uh, what is a false teacher? Uh, what are their characteristics? And how do we go about correcting error and um, testing all things by God's word? Uh, obviously, everybody who doesn't agree with me is not necessarily a false teacher. We have to test all things by God's word. And so, first of all, can the truth be known? Well, in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said to them, uh, those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so there's a couple things that I gather from this passage. Number one is that the source of man's salvation is from truth and from truth alone. It can only be found through God's truth. Number two is all truth is from God. And number three is this shows it's possible, at least according to my understanding, uh, that it's possible for a man to understand God's revealed truth in order to achieve salvation. In John 16, verses 12, 13, Jesus said that he had many things to tell his apostles, but they could not bear them now, verse 12. However, when he, talking about the Holy Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. What do I gather from this? Well, Jesus uh, while he was on earth, had many things to tell his apostles, but they could not understand all of it while he was on earth. But he promised them all truth, the remainder of whatever it was that he uh, had left uh, unsaid. Number two, the Holy Spirit guided these into all truth. If Jesus is to be taken at his word, he said that they would be guided into all truth, so I'm assuming that they were. So number three, my conclusion is by their death, all truth had been delivered to them. I hope you can follow that. So my understanding is that all truth has been delivered. And the previous verse says that uh, salvation comes from us understanding the truth. So I, I surmise that we can understand what truth is. Well, I'm not going to read all this, but last week I talked about uh, Jesus' prayer found in John 17, that he prayed for unity among all of uh, his saints, especially he was praying for his apostles. He said in verse 6, they've kept my word. I've given them the words which you've given me, and I'm reading the things in bold, uh, down to verse 10, that they may be one as we are. Verse 14, I've given them your word. Verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And verse 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone, talking about his apostles, but also for those who believe in me through their word, through the apostles' word, through all the truth that he was going to reveal to them by the Holy Spirit, that they may all be one. So, it kind of recaps what I was talking about last week, that unity is found through the doctrine of Christ, through the teaching of Christ, and through the uh, um, teachings of the apostles that was inspired as a result of the Holy Spirit being sent to them by Jesus. Well, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, means it's God-breathed, and it is profitable for doctrine. Let me stop there. Profitable means useful. All scripture is useful, not some scripture is useful, and the rest of it we can't understand, we throw it out. All scripture is useful. It's useful for what? For doctrine, it's useful for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now I take from this passage several things. One, all scripture is profitable or useful, not just some of it. Number two, all of it is used for teaching as a proof or for reproof, meaning uh, a standard by which we judge everything by. It's used for correcting error, and it's also used for the education of God's people, instruction and in righteousness. I'm just paraphrasing what the original Greek words mean here in number two. And number three, therefore, it must be understood if all of it is to be used. 
You follow that? And so number four says, uh, I, I also assume that it is complete if it can thoroughly equip us, that there's nothing else that I need to add on to God's word. Well, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Paul is pleading with the Corinthians. He says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, I realize that's a difficult thing, <clears throat> but notice Paul's plead. He's using Christ's name, which is a strong plea to the brethren there, to speak the same, to have no divisions, to be joined together, to be of the same mind and same judgment. In other words, to have the mind of Christ. Now, how is that to be achieved? It's to be achieved by coming together in God's truth and studying God's truth together. Well, what about those who teach differently? Aren't they false teachers? Well, let's look at that for a moment. What is a false teacher? Well, I think the Bible tells us uh, we, can, we can gain some things from that. In 2 Peter 2, and verse 1, and by the way, the only chapter that I can find in the New Testament that talks about specifically false teachers is 2 Peter chapter 2. I think they're described in other passages of the New Testament, but specifically the term false teachers are found in 2 Peter 2. And he says, but there were false prophets among the people, meaning in the Old Testament times, even as there shall be false teachers among you, speaking about the New Testament church and among the apostles, who privily shall bring in, and I'm using the King James here, damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. I don't think he's saying that, all, that, that uh, the damnable heresy is denying the Lord. He's saying it is such as this one, meaning they will deny the Lord that bought, that, that bought them, but there's going to be other ones as well and bring upon themselves swift uh, destruction. So a real simple definition is you can just look at the word and say, well, a false teacher is somebody who teaches something that's false. And I would agree with that. But also, false teachers in the context, the way it's used in the, in the passage, is somebody who introduces a damnable heresy, something that uh, in other versions say destructive heresies, meaning a heresy that brings about destruction. A heresy or a false teaching that brings about, and the consequence of it, is that you would be condemned to hell, you see. That you would be damned forever. And the, the original definition, because word change over, word just change over time, is uh, this is Noah's original dictionary. Um, I've been using this lately, and I really like this tool. Uh, damnable means that, may, that which may be damned or condemned, deserving damnation worthy of eternal punishment. So some kind of false teacher would bring in something that would lead somebody to sin in a way that would make them to be condemned, you see. It's, it seems to be more than just a, a simple misunderstanding between brethren over a particular passage. <clears throat> but false teaching is serious. There can only be one right uh, interpretation for any passage. All right, false teachers... Galatians 1, 9 says, As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. So the, Paul's writing to the church in Galatia. He's already been there. He's taught them the gospel. And he says, if anybody else comes along and brings you something contrary to that, they're to be accursed. Well, somebody could say, well, if anybody preaches different than me, they're to be accursed. Well, not necessarily. Anyone preaching differently than the apostles, you see, a different gospel than what the Galatians had received. So we must ensure we have the same gospel that they had. And that involves careful Bible study, doesn't it? Well, last week I talked about the doctrine of Christ, and we used 2 John 1, 9 as the focus of our study. It says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ or inside the teaching does not have God, and the one who abides in the teaching has both God and the Father. So this is the safe place to be, obviously, is inside the teaching inside the doctrine. Again, teaching just means doctrine. It shouldn't be a, a scary word. In our, in our society, we say, doctrine has a bad connotation to it, doesn't it? You're trying to force your doctrine on me. Well, they're just trying to persuade you to their way of teaching. And anybody beyond the doctrine, <coughs> that's dangerous. And that's where false teaching comes in. False teaching goes beyond the doctrine of Christ by its very definition. It's false. False teaching does not abide or remain inside the teaching. So what are characteristics of false teachers? Well, let's go back to 2 Peter 2, and I'm not going to read all this. <coughs> Actually, I lie. I'm going to read all this, and then we're going to summarize it. 1 Peter, if you want to turn your Bibles, it might be helpful as well, to 2 Peter 2. 
But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false uh, teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying, see this one in New King James uses destructive <coughs> instead of damnable. That means heresies that are worthy of destruction. Um, uh, that cause, not just that cause destruction inside the body, but I want you to make that distinction. I used to think that this means somebody's going to bring in some teaching that, that, that causes um, destruction uh, to our unity. And while that is true, it, the real meaning of the word is it is going to lead people to destruction, you see. Okay, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. <coughs> see, that kind of gives you the, the contents of the word. They're going to bring upon themselves destruction. Number two, verse two. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Again, he's talking about describing false teachers here. And I've bolded, <coughs> I've tried to give you bold of, of the, the um, characteristics of false teachers. And he goes on in verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the people of the ungodly, <coughs> and turning the cities of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those afterward to live, who lived ungodly, uh, if God would do all this, <coughs> and, but he delivered uh, righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Uh, and this is a side note. For that righteous man dwelling among them uh, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. If God would do all that, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to, the re and to, reserve, the unjust under, uh, to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness, and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels uh, who are greater in power and might do not bring a, a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil things they do not understand, and they will utterly perish in their own corruption. These are some pretty nasty people, aren't they? and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They've forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. You remember he was the prophet that took a bribe uh, to speak things um, against the way of God. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds without rain or a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts or desires of the flesh, uh, through lewdness, the one who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty or freedom, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also a person is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, than, having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed uh, to her wallowing in the mire. What is my point in reading all this? Descriptions of false teachers are sprinkled through this passage, and I give them to you here. This may not be an exhaustive list, but this is some that, I, that, that uh, popped out in my mind. One is, they teach things in secret. <coughs> um, if anybody comes to you in secret and says, hey, I got a, a great little piece of truth that nobody else understands about the Bible, and they're, not, and they're afraid to tell anybody in public, but they just want to kind of lurk around and, and, hey, recruit people to their view, this is uh, one thing that a false teacher does. Uh, they, they could deny the Lord, but that's just one example. They're covetous. They indulge in their own desires. They despise authority. They're presumptuous. They're self-willed. They speak evil of others. Uh, they're hypocrites. So they, they claim one thing, but their life doesn't show it. They're, they have lustful eyes or adulterous eyes. They can't stop sinning. They're caught in their own sins. They love unrighteous wages. They're arrogant and boastful in their words. 
And they promise freedom or liberty, but they are enslaved to their own sins. Now, does a false teacher have to have every one of these characteristics? Remember we talked about the, the definition of false teaching. If somebody tells you something false, it's false teaching. But oftentimes, these, some of these characteristics might follow somebody who is teaching false. Because remember, false teaching is always a spiritual problem. It's something that, you know, Satan, <coughs> he loves to divide brethren through different uh, errors in truth. And he might use somebody who uh, thinks that they're believing in the truth to go away. And, and usually uh, the way that Satan gets in is through some kind of uh, spiritual defect in our, in our character, some kind of, take advantage of some kind of sin. Well, someone might say, well, this person is speaking something differently from me, but I know that their motives are, are pure, so they're not a false teacher. So I ask you, do we need to know their motives to, in order to determine if they're a false teacher or not? It's a good question. Many people, even some people in our, what we would consider brethren in churches of Christ, believe that as long as somebody has pure motives, then we don't label them as a false teacher. Well, let's look at Matthew 24, 23, and 24. <coughs> Matthew 24, 23, and 24. It says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So, some say that false teachers must have bad motives, but we can't always know a person's real motives, can we? Isn't it possible that we can be deceived? That somebody can come to us and we think that they have good motives? Is it possible that they could even be deceived themselves? 2 Corinthians 11, 3-4 says, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. In other words, Paul was fearful that the Corinthians might accept a different gospel. There was going to be deceptive preaching that would come, and just as... Uh, Adam and Eve were deceived by their craftiness. The Corinthians might get caught up in it. And even if they didn't agree with it, they might put up with it. You see that? Can we not be deceived? I think we can. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. And so the upshot of this is, if Satan himself can pretend to be an angel, what does that say about his servants, or those that are working unrighteous deeds through false teaching? Those who appear to be righteous can certainly be ministers of Satan, can't they? Can we know? How can we know? Well, you... You know by you, you test everything according to God's word. Anything that comes out of my mouth, you have to test it according to God's word because while you think you might know my motives, you don't really know my motives. Only God knows my motives. And the same is true of any teacher. Doctrine is the determination to determine if false teachers exist. But also we have to observe their fruit, don't we? Somebody could be speaking uh, one thing, and it sounds good, but we have to observe the fruit. So Matthew 7, 15 through 20 says, Beware of false prophets. Uh, and again, these are, these are prophets. I mean, technically it's not false teachers, but they're teaching, you see, and they're teaching falsehood. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. Now, would they have seen the wolf coming if it was dressed in sheep's clothing? It would have been very difficult for them to see that. Verse 16 says, You will know them by their fruits. You know, that sheep, that's, that's that's kind of walking like a wolf, you know? That sheep doesn't walk like, a she like all the other sheep does. It looks like a sheep, but it, you know, it's kind of got a different stride to it. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. You know, you know just that makes sense, doesn't it? He's emphasizing that. Every tree that does not bear good fruits cut down and thrown to the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Would you take financial advice from a guy who was flat broke? You know, would you let that guy invest your money? You know, would you take stock advice from this guy? No. Um, and many times, people who 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 tend to be teaching things that sound good, 
we have to investigate not only their doctrine by God's word, but also the fruit of their lives. All right, <clears throat> back to false teachers. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 20 and 21, Paul's giving Timothy some advice. He says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, and that was the gospel, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. So sometimes false teaching can appear to be knowledge. Hey, um, you want to you come over to my house tonight? I want to show, show you something. You know, uh, I, I don't teach this publicly because brethren can't handle it. But um, I want to share it with you because I think you're mature. You know? See, that's false knowledge. See, that's something taught in secret and appealing that, hey, we're going to know something everybody else doesn't know. It's contradiction. It's a contradiction to the faith. Jude 1.3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. See, real knowledge of faith has already been delivered. And that's what Jude's saying. That the faith or the doctrine has been delivered, everything is there, and there's no new thing to be discovered. You see. Um, by the way, there's a term that some of you may have heard is called Gnosticism, which is its appeal to this higher knowledge. And um, some, even brethren, take pride on knowing, you know, more things or deeper meanings than, than other folks. And we all have to be on guard against that because we want to know everything that's in the scriptures. And we might be getting, we might get tempted to some higher level of knowledge that's not really there. And so um, I have to admit that we all need to be on guard against it. Many false teachers are sincere in their beliefs, is my point. In 2 Thessalonians 2, and verse 9 through 12, says, The coming of the lawless one, and I think he's just talking to, um, my understanding of this passage is not talking about a particular individual, but anyone who is lawless. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the truth, the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So these are people who did not receive a love of the truth. So what's going to happen? For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. My point again here is that somebody who has not a love for the truth, God has sent them a strong delusion. They now believe that strong delusion. Well, then they teach that strong delusion, you see. And they sincerely and with conviction do it. And everybody who's hearing them thinks, oh, well, you know, so-and-so's a good guy. I know he's really honest and sincere. <clears throat> False teachers often believe the things that they say. We were studying in 1 Kings recently about King Ahab and his false prophets. King Ahab, went, he wanted to go to war to take some cities, and he asked the prophets, asked his prophets, should I go or not? And his false prophets said, yeah, go ahead and take it. And But the real man of God told him what was really true. In verse Kings 22, 11, Zedekiah, the son of uh, Chaniah, he was the false prophet. He made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they're destroyed. But he was a false prophet. And later, down in verse 23 and 24, uh, it says, Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Now, Zedekiah, the guy who spoke the falsehood, he was the son of Shania, he went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek, who was the real prophet. The false prophet goes and strikes the real prophet. He says, which way did the spirit uh, come from me and basically go into you? In other words, he was so convicted that what he was saying was right. When he heard the truth, the false prophet was honestly believed what he said, so much so that he was convicted enough to slap the real prophet. So my point is, Deception may appear to be sincere. And Zedekiah, the false prophet, even had conviction in his own teaching. But God had sent a lying spirit. Why? Because they did not have a love of the truth. In Acts 9, verses 1 and 2, you remember Saul. Well, see, Paul, or the apostle Paul, or Saul, he wasn't always a Christian. In Acts 9, 1 and 2, says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked them, uh, to give him letters so he could send him to the, go to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, meaning if he found any Christians in Damascus, he could bring them bound to prison. 
He was doing this with a good conscience. He believed, even though what he was doing was false against Christ, he believed it. In Acts 23, 1, he said that. He said, it says, Paul, then looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. <coughs> so do false teachers have to have bad motives to be false teachers? False teachers can be honest in their own heart. They can be sincere in their own heart. They can have a perfectly good conscience. But it doesn't mean that they're teaching the truth. So what's the real danger in false teaching? Well, Matthew 16 and 6 through 12, uh, Jesus is warning his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, they th thought he was talking about bread. But down in verse 12, he said, uh, in verse 11, he says, um, How is it you understand that I was speaking to you about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And oh, now they get it. He understood that he was talking about the teaching of the, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, why should they be so concerned about the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Well, the idea is that false teaching spreads. Galatians 5.9 says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Uh, false teaching can work quietly and unnoticed. It can come in in a congregation and, and it can start off with somebody has some crazy idea and they start promoting it quietly in, in, in brethren's homes and one-on-one and -on -one conversations and in private Bible studies and then first thing you know, half the congregation believes this thing, and then boom, it's a big blow up and a division. It can spread through the whole church quietly. A lot of times, by the time you know it's there, it's already too late to do anything about it. And so that's why we have to be on guard against it. Another thing is false teaching can cause others to sin. If false teaching makes concession uh, and says something is okay when God has condemned it, then you have people who are now sinning, thinking that they're right with God. False teaching causes, oftentimes, can cause people to sin. Not every time. Not every false teaching causes people to sin. But again, the damnable heresies, remember, were, were ideas that were brought in that led people to destruction. And as a result of the teachings, people would be condemned. So, how should we treat those who are in error? It's a good question. In Acts 18, 24 through 28, this is the story about Ananias and Sapphira talking to a Jew named Apollos. It said, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, he came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he didn't know everything. Well, um, it says, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Now, Aquila and Prilla, Priscilla heard this. They could have stood up in the middle of the synagogue and shut him down. They could have called him out in front of everybody. They could have made a big stink right there in the synagogue. But what they did is, is it looks to me that they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. In verse 27, and when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. He's accepted this new teaching. He knows the way of God more accurately. And he goes over and he's a great help to those uh, other Christians in other places. He vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Well, in Acts 19, I don't have the scripture there, but they had to go to Ephesus and rebaptize some people who had only heard about the Gospel of John. Quite possible, this could have been a result of Apollos' false teaching, or incomplete teaching, I should say. I don't know, uh, some of us were uh, debating about whether or not uh, Apollos would have been considered a false teacher when he accurately taught about the things of the Lord. He just didn't know all of it. But what my point in using this passage is, how do we approach somebody who's teaching error or incomplete in their knowledge? Well, one good way would be to take them aside, to teach them more accurately, and often there's a lot of wisdom in, in approaching somebody privately, and, and it's wiser than confronting somebody in public. But sometimes it's appropriate to confront somebody in front of others. In Galatians 2, 11 through 14, uh, Peter um, and Paul had a conflict in understanding. Now Peter had come to Antioch. Paul says, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came to James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came... He withdrew and separated himself, fearing those of the circumcision. So, here's the gist of it. Uh, what Peter was doing is when the Jews weren't around, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when the Jews showed up, he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles, you see. So, he was being kind of 
two-faced in essence. And uh, Paul says he withstood him to his face. In verse 13, And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. And that was the problem. Verse 14, When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, before them all, so he, he approached Peter to his face in front of everybody, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So what do we learn from this? Well, in the previous passage, I said, Apollos uh, was taught in private. Well, here, Peter was taught in front of everybody. But, always talk to somebody's face and not behind their back. You see, that was the first thing he did. Uh, if you have a problem with somebody, go directly to them and talk to them to their face. Also, address error in front of others if they're also involved in the error. You know, I take that from there. These other people were being hypocrites with them. But, in any case, always use good judgment. I can't tell you what that's going to be for your case, but you know the end goal, what it should be, and that should be the end goal is that everybody understands what the truth is and everybody's united. Uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, I know the ladies have been recently studying in Ephesians, right, in your ladies class. <coughs> uh, and he, uh, I believe it was Christ, he himself gave some to be apostles to the church, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting. That's false teaching. Verse 15, But speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. Now, another concept is we need to speak the truth, but we need to speak it with love. And that's hard, isn't it? I'm guilty of not speaking the truth always with love. I need to be more loving. And I think we could all say the same of ourselves. But in any case, we need to avoid craftiness and deceitful plotting. Um, another thing in correcting error is uh, the book of Jude. I love the book of Jude because it talks a lot about false teachers, but I'd like to share this with you. Starting in verse 16, these are grumblers, finding fault, following their own lust, talking about false teachers. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of, the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust." These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now, I think there's three approaches here um, to handling people in error, but first of all, we need to build up our faith, we need to pray about it, and we need to always keep ourselves in love. To those who are doubting whether or not a false teaching is true or not, I think we need to have merciful instruction. To somebody who's in a spiritual crisis, we need to snatch them out of the fire. And to somebody who's in sin, we need to show mercy but we need to be afraid as well because we don't want to be caught up in that sin either. Uh, we hate the garment that's polluted by the flesh. Well, and by contrast, let's look at some characteristics of God's teachers. We talked about characteristics of false teachers. Um, and this is some qualifications uh, of an evangelist that Paul's writing to Timothy, but I think it talks about all of the Lord's servants. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering, in other words, patience, and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers. They're just going to want to hear what they want to hear. They're only going to be friends with those who agree with them. And they will turn their ears away from the truth 
and they will turn aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And he goes on in 2 Timothy 2, or this is previous to that in verse 23 and 26, a lot of wisdom in this. But avoid foolish and, ir- and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. It's a spiritual problem, and God's workers need to use, um, be very careful to use all the, the equipment and all the, all the armor of God that, that he's provided for us. Love, humility, gentleness, everything we need to be prepared when we're dealing with people like that. Again, the, left on, the list on the left is long-suffering and patient, watchful in all things, enduring afflictions, avoiding foolish and ignorant, ignorant disputes. Uh, God's teachers don't quarrel. They're gentle. They're humble. So is everyone a false teacher who disagrees with me? Certainly not. 1 John 4, 1-6 through 6 says, Beloved, I do not believe every spirit. Uh, sorry, he says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out by the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. If every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God, well, that's easy. But what about all the other teachings? I think down in verse 6 it says, He who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the Spirit of truth and the Spirit of error. Well, we need to test all teaching, but God's Word is the standard, and the Spirit of truth will listen to the will listen to truth. Who are we supposed to hear? We're supposed to hear Jesus and his teachings. We're supposed to hear the teachings of the apostles and those who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, it's not saying uh, he who hears Joe Ham is of God. No, it's he who listens to the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the apostles. 1 Thessalonians 5, um, 19 and 22, through 22 says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. And Acts 17, 11, I hope we all have the mind of the noble-minded Bereans that when they hear something new, they search the scriptures to see if those things are really so. Well, 1 John uh, two nineteen says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be known it would be shown that they are not all of us. So we need to preach the truth on all things. But true followers of Christ will be united in truth, and everybody else will get out of the way. They're not going to want to stay around if you're preaching truth. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen 19 says, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. So this is a purifying mechanism that the unity of, the unity of true believers will be united in truth, and people who don't accept God's truth will be divided. Over time, those in error will either repent or they will leave. And if error is taught, it will get exposed. If it's done in secret, it may not get exposed. And that's that's what I was talking about before, that that's one of the the signs of a false teacher. Well, what is this word heresies? There must be heresies among you. Well, a heresy is something that is a fundamental flaw in opinion, uh, according to the doctrine. And Titus 3.10 says, A man that is a heretic, after a first and second admonition, we're supposed to reject. Well, a heretic is somebody who teaches heresies or opinions that are contrary to the established faith. And so the, the process is we don't all agree with one another, but we come together and we study with one another, and hopefully we show all the, the um, qualities of a servant of God, a teacher of God, patient, loving, long-suffering, willing to be wrong. And then we work through those things, you know. But if, if we all agree that something's false... We don't tolerate the falsehood. That's the main thing. Um, Because those things divide and those things can uh, cause other people to sin. There's many people who know that something's a heresy, but they fail to reject the man who's teaching the heresy. And that, that, my my friends, is not God's plan. We cannot tolerate error because it will leaven the whole lump. So I have some questions for you this morning in closing. Have you tested all things? Have you tested the gospel? Have you found them to be true? Not just what I talked about this morning, but the message that, of Jesus Christ, that he came, 
that God was sent, uh, sent his son in the flesh to die for our sins, that we were separated by God because of our sins. And he died for us so that we could be, uh, have a right relationship with God. Have you been found in sin? Have you decided to repent of that sin? Have you decided to follow Jesus? Have you been baptized into Christ? And for those who are Christians, are you obeying all his commands? It's something for us to think about. We need to appreciate that without Jesus Christ, we're going to hell. If it wasn't for what he did for us that we remember this morning in the Lord's Supper, if it wasn't for what he did, all of us are sinful, even if we're trying to be holy and righteous right now, based on all of our things that we've already done in our life, we deserve to go to hell eternally. We need to appreciate the fact that Jesus Christ is the only thing keeping us out of it. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that this morning. I invite you, if you're not ready to do it this morning, seriously to consider what your destiny is without Christ. You're destined for hell. That's just the reality of it. But God has given us an opportunity to turn from our own ways, to accept God's ways, and to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and his apostles, and for us to have eternal life. If there's anything we can do for anyone this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.